of pattern seeking animals. All right, so um, so you guys got this little thing going on here. Call yourselves pattern seeking animals. We do. And you are an amazingly productive band of individuals, apparently, because you've only missed one year in the last five putting out an album. And that wasn't because we missed it. We missed it because it takes six months to process vinyl. Fair enough. So, so otherwise you'd be on target. Yeah, this last album, we actually kind of slowed down our process a bit and took our time. Um, in spite of the fact that uh, Frank has a faster pace than Rich Mauser does, which is, it's not a better thing. It's just... Yeah, yeah. You know, some people work one way, some people work another way. and <clears throat> um, But yeah, we, we kind of took our time in between, you know, batches of time working on the record. And um, uh, John used a few more outside sources this time for, for some of like the background vocals and things. So there were other people's schedules to consider and all that as well. Whereas it's normally just do the drums. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, right? Right. So, yeah, so this last album took a little bit longer than our previous ones, but it's still faster than any other progressive rock band out there. For that matter, it's on Elton John pace. Oh, well. You know, Beatles, Elton John pace. We're going to try to keep, you know, how did they do it? (laughs) Three albums in one year? Um, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, that's that's, that's uh, it's only one other band I think keeping up that kind of pace, and I won't name them because they're not here and they don't get the time. <laughs> oh, I don't care. Your time. Who else? Who else does this this fast? Uh, what uh, King Gizzard and the Wizard Lizard? Oh, jeez. <laughs> they're cranking out about as fast as I can say the title of their last album. By the time I finish the title, they put out another one. Yeah. So yeah, they're they're busy boys. So it, it's, it's but it's interesting because. The name, the name of the of band, band, as I understand, as I understand is a description, description of, humans of humans in the in sense of looking, looking for uh, meaning, meaning and or predictability, predictability I'd, like I'd like to say. say. And, and so in so that, in that sense, sense, how would you, how would say, you say this, this album is reflective of, of that concept? concept? Wow. I, I have no idea. You know, to be honest, um, I couldn't even begin to tell you, like, the words to half the songs. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, I learn the words that I have to sing and then I hear them and, and I've heard all the songs, you know, a handful of times each, you know, all yeah. the way through finished. Um, <clears throat> other than just kind of getting a gist of what's going on when, when I'm recording, just to know like, okay, what is this song about? Um, I kind of let it go. So I, I would be the worst person. I'm, I'm the worst person to ask that. That's a John question because mm. he's the one that writes it all and i just play drums so <laughs> fair enough <laughs> uh, yeah I guess sorry I, i'm it's uh, yeah, that's yeah. more of a question for john but i guess in the yeah, sense you guys yeah, have uh you know you get your thing going on where you're doing it annually and i'm going what what does it take to maintain that pace uh as a band keep putting them out it it takes john writing songs yeah um and it's not like john says I'm the only songwriter in the band. He's just constantly writing. Um, he would love input from all of us. If we came in, if I came in and said, hey, man, I've got this germ of a song, it would be welcome. And, and you know, Ted's a phenomenal songwriter. Dave's a great song. A lot of that, a lot of that second generation Spock's Beard stuff was, was John and Dave. Right. Um, but for some reason, they just, the two of them have not been productive. And I've never really been much of a songwriter on the on the grand sense of it, I'll I'll contribute, but I've never really been a songwriter from scratch. Right, right. So I'm sort of useless in that regard. But it would be great to get some input from Dave and Ted because they're so they're both great yeah. songwriters. But it's really just John. He he is a his day job is an apartment manager. There's oh, a no kid. series of apartments here. We, we live pretty close to each other, and uh, he manages you know for company and so his job doesn't require him to go to an office or yeah. it's sort of oh something needs attention right now okay i'll go do it and then he's got hours and hours to whatever or one day maybe it's crazy busy and the next day it's not so he has time and his house is pretty much just a big studio <laughs> <laughs> That's so, 
So he's always writing. And I mean, he's not always writing for us, but he's always writing in some fashion. Yeah. So there's just this, you know, a, a, even if he has writer's block for a couple of months, it doesn't matter because he's still on, you know, on a much faster pace than most songwriters go. Wow. So, yeah, by the time we finish recording an album and going through the promotion, like now, we're, we're, the album's coming out at the end of the month. Yeah. Um, once again, we're forever trying to do a tour. It's just, you know, the costs of it and everything are so so obscene. Um, but by the time we finish promoting this album, he'll already have most of the next album done. That's amazing. And he'll send us, and he'll start, you know, putting stuff in the Dropbox going, hey, I've got a few more songs, check them out. And he'll send us demos. And his demos are for, fully formulated demos. I mean, they're, they've got background vocals and and, you know, drum parts and bass parts and everything all you know, kind of flushed out. And, you know, when we get to the studio, we'll, I'm usually first. Right, right. So the first thing happens is we go, okay, this is either, this is a great part. Let me, you know, interpret this for a drum set. Or we say, this isn't something that would necessarily work on a kit. Let me adapt it. Yeah. Um, or we just tear it apart. We just go, yeah, I don't know. I was kind of hearing it like this. And he's always like, great, do that. <laughs> That's and good. He's that space for you. The only, yeah, the only sad thing about it is that I'm first to record. I don't get to hear what everyone else contributes and then get oh. to respond. Like yeah. the old school, you know, old days, you had a band that would all meet together in a, in a studio and, and flush out ideas. Or, you know, over a tour, they'd, they'd right. tour for one album. And while they're on doing sound checks and in the bus, they'd flush out songs. And, you know, oh, what if we did this? What if we did that? And so we don't really get to do that. So I do something and I, sort of establish this is the intent of the song but based on how heavy I'm playing or how light I'm playing. Mm -hmm. um, and then everyone else responds. I don't get right. to respond back. Is hmm. the only thing. Because I'll hear Dave will come up with a you know, great yeah. bass drum part. Oh, you know what? I could play to that. Nah. <laughs> I never get to do that. So. Never get to do it's it. The, so. It's the only... Ah. Oh, yeah, right. First take has to be the one that lives, I guess. Is that yeah, it? that's it. Whatever we come up with on, on my past, that's how it goes. Wow. Okay, so I guess that that's interesting. That's the first I think I've heard it that way, because I'm used to hearing, because it sounds like you're all working remotely. You're not all taking yeah. turns in the same studio. That is something that is fairly common practice these days. Yeah. I, I guess the other part is that you lose that opportunity to really kind of bounce off of one another. Uh, like on one hand, it's freeing a little bit because you go, Ooh, I can do whatever I want. Right. On the other I, hand, that, that feedback loop never exists to maybe build upon it even further than maybe you had thought of on your own. Yeah, there is, there are occasions in which one or all of us will come in after hearing the demo and say, Hey, what do you, how do you guys feel about, a, you know, this kind of an approach? Yeah. Cause usually because John's ideas are so fully flushed out, it's pretty, I mean, it, this, it kind of dictates where I'm going to go already. Right. Um, I add personality, but for the most part, it's, it's usually about 70% there. So right. I'm just reinterpreting it for a drum set as opposed to drum machine, which sometimes there's things you can't physically do or, yeah. um, or just the, the nature of what it is to play adds things or, or, you know, but those are all minor details. It's very unusual that, well, it's, it's not that it's unusual. We have on occasion times where I'll hear the demo and then get John and the guys in the phone and go, love the song. What about this thing? Or Dave, you know, one of us will say, hey, have we thought about trying this or maybe this section? And, and if, from what I understand, Ted will even talk, you know, about lyrics. He'll adapt lyrics on occasion, you know, just because it's like, uh, this doesn't sing very well, or mm. um, I don't really fully understand the meaning of this, you know, help me understand. And then they'll kind of reconstruct a little bit. Right. And that's, I mean, that's one of the, the great things about John as a songwriter is he's, he's open, open-minded to all of our input and, you know, and supports it and asks for it. So yeah. whether it's a lyrical change or a rhythmic change or a, you know, whatever it is, it still gets a round of communication, right. but okay. at some point I go in drums, boom. <laughs> and unless there's some really weird thing at the end of it, I go, you know what? I, I, I want to reapproach that song. We did that with Spock's a couple of times. Uh -huh. 
Um, but but we haven't done it with with patent seeking animals just because it's it's all been pretty. No, this is great. <laughs> Leave yeah. it alone. It ain't broke. <laughs> that sounds so. in many ways sounds like a very relaxed. Maybe I, I hate to use the word easy, but it might be easier than some other gigs you've had. So I'm curious in terms of the composition and the, and the collaboration there, how does that compare with previous gigs for you? Is this, is this where you've gone, wow, I'm really comfortable with this or is it just different? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I come from a session world. I, I grew yeah. up more, I've been in and out of bands. I've had them over the course of my career. Like I had a band at the beginning. I had a band in the middle of my career. Um, and then, as a sort of in and out member of spots and then this band. Um, but they've always been at these moments as opposed to a full thread throughout my career. Mm-hmm. So being from a, a session mindset, my approach in the studio is always a lot more uh, flexible. I, I'm used to the idea of what do you want? How do I interpret what you want? Let me give you what you want as opposed to, um, that's more common than, Hey man, let's do this. Yeah. So it makes the process easier, especially if I like, you know, if the artist I'm working for, you know, whether it's the band or it's just a, you know, a session thing, if they've really given thought to their ideas or if they've given thought to the, the idea of they know how I play. So when they composed and produced the demo, right either they made a really vague drum part simply just to kind of give them a, a, a foundation to, to do the demo. And then they come to me and say, you play drums, right? Whatever you do is what we're going to go with. Those are, those are basically the two scenarios that I deal with. So either way, it's, it's very rare that I get in a studio thing where we fight over anything. Right. Um, Spocks we had, I mean, the, <laughs> the closest we came to a, a fight in that regard is Al was very adamant about like, this is Prague, man, you can play more. <laughs> it's like, well, and, and I mean, that actually came up quite a bit, you right. know, him reminding me that this is, you know, a type of music that can be busy. But again, my, my session experience was always, well, I, hear, I know that, but I'm more inclined to, to play with the, you know, to give you the space. Right. And after tracking all the drums for brief nocturnes, when Al went in to track his guitars, he actually called and said, Oh my God, I, I, I never realized this, but suddenly I'm, I'm recognizing that there's all this space. There's room for my ideas. Right. So even as he and Rio start duking it out for, for space within the arrangement, (laughs) there's room for it because I didn't play so much. I left, I, I took the GAD approach, the, the Jeff Picaro approach. Right. And still have my moments of, you know, look at me, look at me, look at me, check it out, check it out, check it out. Um, it also means that when I do those things, they tend to have a stronger statement as opposed to this long 15 minute song that's filled with noodly bits. And yeah, that's just my my approach to it all. So it hopefully it leaves room for the band to be creative and try ideas and. Uh, instead of just cluttering things up. Right. And there's nothing wrong. There's people that can do that really well. Keith Moon yeah. played <laughs> solo through the bit. whole song and it worked for some reason. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think to an extent, I imagine a lot of that kind of will come out of experience working as a session musician, if I'm not mistaken, because you're yeah. going to come in and your role isn't necessarily too get in the way of or outshine the other people that for whom you're playing. Right. So, you know, you begin to to learn to sense and be aware of, Hey, it's not just all about me hitting things. Right. So to and speak. also the idea that very often in a session, you're the, you're the only person tracking or it's you and the bass player. Yeah. You know, or, or the root rhythm section, or maybe there's a guitar player in there as well. It's the realization of there's going to be more happening. You have to, you know, you have to kind of hear the song in your head finished. What else is going to be? Oh, a B3 player is going to come in or, a, you know, the horn section is going to come in. So you have to right. know that there's more to this arrangement than just, you know, possibly not every song. But, the, you know, you talk to the producer, you talk to the artist and go, what else is going to be happening? 
okay, well, if there's a horn section, I need to leave space for that horn section. Oh, there's a percussionist that's going to come in. If I play too much, I don't give any, I don't leave any room for the percussionist. Right. So you, you know, if you have all those things in your head, you're more likely to play conservatively, which is what makes, you know, drummers like Steve Gadd and Jeff Picaro and J.R. Robinson and Keltner and all those guys, you know, the, the gods. Yeah. Whatever the style of music, you know, it's, even Alan White, like if you get into the prog world, part of the reason I tend to lean more towards Alan's playing, not that I don't love and respect Bill Bruford, but Alan played more from a session play, player's point of view. He tended to play backbeats more often and sort of straighten things out, whereas Bruford was all about making it weird and and <laughs> maybe even uncomfortable at times. Yeah. Which it's it's not a right or wrong. It's a different approach. It's sure. you know, and if the band works that way, obviously they worked that way in the beginning and you know made fantastic records. I tend to be more, you know, the Alan White approach. Right. Let's take this weird 17, 16 thing and <laughs> straighten it out and because <laughs> if people are gonna be dancing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but there's a lot to be said for somebody who can play, and I've said it many times before usually when talking about guitarists because you know there's always that school of thought of how many notes can you hit in a minute yeah. versus you know how much feeling can you put into what you're doing and it's easy for i think at times people to forget that that applies to drummers too just as yeah. much you know and there's a lot to be said for creating some atmosphere for it uh with it rather and and as well as blowing our minds you know right. like you mentioned guys who are of in and of themselves session background and also learning to give space to those around them as opposed to competing for attention in some way or yeah. seeing like how far can i take this over the top which doesn't work for everybody you know it's 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 it varies and you know I, i'm getting that perception for you it's i don't you don't dig the over the top quite as much as you dig. Hey, here's somebody that can, that knows the space he's playing in and can do a lot with it without overwhelming his bandmates. Yeah. I, I again, it's not even that I think one is better than the other. I, yeah. I'll, I'm more than happy to, you want me to go over the top? I will <laughs> not to use a goofy pun, but um, <clears throat> I'm a big Keith Moon fan too. Yeah. I'm a big Terry Bozio fan. I'm a big, you know, uh, you know, Carter Beaufort plays a lot, but Carter yeah. Beaufort focuses on the hi hat. Stuart Copeland focuses on the right. hi hat. You focus on those that part of the drum kit. You tend to stay out of the bigger drums that take up space. Right. right. Um, <clears throat> I love that as much. If the song calls for it, oh man, yeah, I'll, I'll I can take you way, way over the top. <laughs> <laughs> But it's but my approach is usually what's the yeah. least amount I can do first, and then go okay. This has space for that. This we can do this. We can take this a little further. We can play heavier, harder. Right. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's it's again, it's always the approach of I start conservative and then yeah, fill in the gaps. So that's an interesting thought too, because playing in a progressively <clears throat> oriented band and knowing that there are those opportunities to you know really rip it off except that a lot of those come live and i guess you guys really haven't been having that opportunity too much or haven't had that focus and i imagine you might miss that a little bit you might miss those opportunities yeah. to really just blow some people off the stage a little bit right yes yeah especially this band because because it's such a strong, I mean, there's so much talent in the band. I mean, Ted is a fantastic right. guitar player. Uh, I mean, his singing, obviously, you know, with all the, the bands that he's been in, we know he's, you know, one of the best singers in, in the whole genre. Right. Dave, there should be magazines to Dave. <laughs> um, I'm really surprised that he is not constantly, you know, in the top 10 lists, yeah. you know, whenever these, you know, these online magazines or Rolling Stone, whatever like that. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with they don't get to hear Dave in the, the ways that I get to hear him. I hear him in the prog world, but I so, also hear him in the pop world. You know, when we do cover gigs together or we do other sessions together that none of the 
progressive people here. He's one of the most versatile musicians I've ever worked with. His time and feel are, he adapts magic. I mean, to, to go from, I mean, at any given night when we were out with Fox, he's got to go from playing with me, songs that he composed and recorded initially with Nick, now mm -hmm. being interpreted by me. So he has to adapt yeah. what he did to the way I feel it and, and approach it. And then two songs later, he's back to playing with Nick. So he's got to adapt to an entirely different drummer. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think people understand what, what goes on in, in that. I mean, what's involved in being able to do that. And Dave's just, I, he's as good as it gets. And there's lots of great bass players in Prague. Lots of, you know, you know, Flower Kings and you right, know, Chris right. Squire, of course, and Geddy Lee and all the, the, the legendary guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but Dave is is that level, if not beyond. Yeah. Um, Do you think at some point what fans of that genre of Prague will tend to almost take a lot of that for granted to the point that they stop being wowed by people at some point? <laughs> You know, I think that's an issue. It's funny you say that. I think that's actually an issue with this band on whole. Yeah. I think uh, this is a maybe a strange thing to say, and it can be interpreted. Who knows? But I almost feel like Frog fans are sort of taking this band for granted. Right. I mean, part of it is because we, we do contain so many elements of another band. You know, yeah. from the first three albums being tracked with Rich. You know, so you had basically three three band members, a, an an active product production member, songwriter, and the engineer. You know, okay, duh. There's going to be that whole yeah connection. Um, but I think I I can kind of sum it up like this. And and again, maybe there's some maybe my ego is creeping in on here. But like we went on the the. The last cruise. Right. We had no idea what to expect. Um, I mean, we kind of figured there would be, we would have a fan base, and even like Spock's Beard fans would go, well, it's most of Spock's Beard. Mm -hmm. We were kind of, yeah. I mean, because in, uh, ego aside, that comes into play. You have to sort of, you know, analyze, okay, what, how are we going to do? How are we going to fare in all this? So you start adding things up going, hopefully that will, that will have an impact. Hopefully that will mean something and it will mean people will come to the show, even if it's just out of curiosity. That's yeah. all fine. What surprised us is that both the venues we played were packed. As full as you can get. And in, in both cases, uh, even a little more than the other bands that played those venues. So we were very shocked by this. Um, hmm. the thing that was weird about it is okay so that was it was a great you know it, it felt great to see right. all the people and to get the support on that level but then if you go back and look at all the photographs of that cruise and you know the and the, the cruise wrap up hmm. find us let me know if you see us anywhere when you read the wrap ups of the week or of the, of the, the, the daily, what happened today? Yeah. See if you can find us mentioned. Wow. We end up on, we start off the year, or we, because well, most of our albums have come out in October. Whatever, the, it'll start off with the album is released and we'll hear everyone saying, this is definitely on my, you know, best of. And I realize it's only, you know, this amount of time and we've only heard this. This is definitely on my best of. By the end of the year, there's some people, we have a couple of, you know, online magazine people that are like, no, this has been strong mm. the whole way through. But it's like, it's almost as though, in, in a complimentary way, it's expected. Right. Yeah, you guys should be making records like this. Okay, well, I'll take that as a compliment, if that's oh, yeah. what it is. But there's also this feeling of, like, oh yeah, those guys are doing another record. Yeah, it's great. They're doing exactly what we expected, so it doesn't get our hey. attention. <laughs> yeah, it's it's and they focus more on and I love the idea of focusing on a new band too. If a new band sure. has got your attention, like, yeah, good support the new guys and and keep the blood flowing and you know right, right. supporting the, the genre. 
Um, but there's also the, you liked this three months ago. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Where did that go? What changed? Uh, there's also the fight of technology. You know, it's like right. nobody buys things anymore, even though Prague is probably the, the one genre where people still buy physical oh, yeah. uh, CDs and everything like that. But I don't know. I, I, I wonder if that's what it is. It's sort of a taken for granted kind of thing. And I, I don't know what to, to make of it. I, I, yeah. I'm still trying to process all that. <laughs> <laughs> like I, half I think, of them are taking it for granted. The other half might be not realizing what's happening until they go, oh, wait, that's who's in that band. And Yeah. And the fact that we have, like you said, we haven't had a chance to play yeah. live and to go out and remind people in their face. Right. Here's this band. Remember how great Dave is as a bass player? Now you're going to hear the thunder and the power yeah. coming off the stage of how brilliant he is. Right. And, you know, what a great rhythm section that Dave and Ted and I make up. And, and especially with the, we take out the two guys, we take out Walter and, and Dennis, who are both nutty talented. Right. You know, it's, we haven't had the chance to really, you know, kick everyone's ass, so to speak. And that lineup of musicians you know, I'll step away from it and look at those guys and say, yeah, those are all ridiculously talented guys. So I think if we got some shows under our belt. Right, right. Um, but again, the cost of that, you know. Mm. Yeah, everything I've heard is is touring is is very rough to make good money these days. It's it's become very Any expensive. Money. It's, and it's it become becomes very, a loss. Yeah, yeah. Which is a shame because I can say we, I'm going to speak for the entire Praga sphere, as I like to call it, <laughs> Let's say we would love to see you guys come out on tour. And it sounds like this is your way of gently letting us down to say we're probably not doing that this time around. I am. I've sort of become the de facto person trying to make that happen. And uh, it's it really comes down to the challenge of... Uh, it's so expensive to get over to Europe now. Right. The cost of the bus, the cost of fuel, hmm. the cost of gear rental, and then venues that are willing to, you know, it's, we're still considered a new band. We're four yeah. albums in <laughs> with, with, a, you know, with this, these guys. I mean, it's, you know, Ted has his history with Enchant and Spox and whatever bands, and Dave has his history and my history, and then the history of the two guys we take out with us. And it's still a new band. Well, we can't really take a chance. You don't really have that kind of, you know, the guarantees they give us are like, dude, okay. No, oh, man. <laughs> I make more money in a cover band at home. <laughs> wow. So it's like when, when you start looking at the idea of, sure, we could do a tour, but we'd come home $15,000 in debt. Yeah. And still having to pay the rent because I've been yeah. gone for three weeks and there's the rent in a week. <laughs> so it's <laughs> like, yeah. It just becomes entirely prohibitive. And it's, yeah. it's sad because that's all we want to do is play. Right, we right. really want to take this music out because I think this music is much more conducive to a live setting than, than the recordings. I think live, it sounds better. Wow. It's more dramatic. That's you get the lot, ambience though. of the room and um, you get the, the, the emotion of, the, of playing for an audience. Yeah. Um, especially the first album. I think the first album would sound better live. Yeah, yeah, and I think people would actually appreciate it more hearing because the first album's a lot more dramatic. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe I'd say not this as one's pretty dramatic as well. <laughs> Listening, yeah. To so, from, far. well, from what you've heard, and and yes. it goes, I think this album goes a lot more all over the map in terms mm -hmm. of emotional stages and, um, yeah, in terms of drama. You know, there's there's quieter moments. You haven't really heard any of the quieter moments. Um, the first three songs have been pretty. I mean, have you heard the whole record? Um, not all the way through yet, no, because I only had okay. so much available to me to download uh, in advance for PR purposes. So, oh, okay, okay. So you heard it? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I think this this album uh, is a bit more of some more emotional swinging, right? Than the previous albums. Um, I'm curious how people respond to that. Yeah. Um, well, the one thing that struck me was like, and, and I was happy there were lyric sheets. So even though I haven't heard all the songs, I have read through all of them. Yeah. And really, I, I really like it. But I, I, 
what I'm seeing is something that you, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong places. I don't feel like I see quite as often anymore is some real serious storytelling going on. I mean, there are That's... characters here who, who, you know, even though they each occupy a song and it's not some long overarching narrative about say one character like bands have done, it's these little what? snippets and yet they feel very fleshed out. And yeah, you know, like there, there's definitely some emotion behind them and, and very evocative imagery, which I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And especially some of those first songs, I thought, you know, album title is spooky action from a distance at a distance. <laughs> pardon me. I keep going to say from a distance. Um, and it's coming out days before Halloween, and you, you've got references to. Poe I don't know how that stuff. was a coincidence. <laughs> Is that a coincidence? Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, just, yeah. Like, that's well just like, oh, okay. <laughs> and even the album cover gives me like this whole like H.P. Lovecraft kind of feel to it, you know, like this like science fiction horror kind of thing. I don't know if that was the way or the direction you, you guys were trying to go. It's like it's it's very interesting. So I'm, I'm curious I, how much I. <sighs> still have to kind of go back through it again and see can i perceive the the overarching theme of the album if there is one or is it just a no, bunch of stories it's just a bunch of stories yeah john's never been one much but we actually all three kind of talk about the idea of concept albums and go Ugh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um i think i think it's just the way john tells stories yeah i think you know he he does that he has a way of in this little moment i mean because the fortunate thing of progressive rock is you don't have this two and a half, three minute limitation. Right. Even though sometimes every once in a while, the songs do come in shorter. You have this, you don't have limits on that. You can write a story. Yeah. So it gives you room to do a bit of development. Um, we had looking for one of the songs that we did. It was a, <laughs> um, one of the songs that he wrote, was fun because originally oh the first album there was a song called these are my things mm. <laughs> so that song actually goes back to uh the first time i heard it was in the the sessions for brief nocturnes mm. it was originally okay. scheduled to be on that record for Spox. right and the original lyric that i heard which i don't even know if it's his first pass but the first time i heard it the character that was depicted in that was dark <laughs> <laughs> and i loved it it was like the one of the like one of the three or four songs that of the, the first batch that i heard i was like oh i like this song a lot <laughs> because the the deeper the song is the deeper the characters the more i can kind of go into a different kind of playing right um but this character was i mean the story already as it ended up tells of a of a guy that's just all about his obsessions his possession his possessions and obsessions at the, you know, at, at the risk of his family, you know, he alienates his family, he alienates his friends. This, the original version, it was even, he, he was just a really dark, wow. uh, I don't know, who would that fit? You know, very, um, uh, trying to think of the director that would, that would have written, uh, anyway, it's, I just loved it. I loved this character just because it was like reading down these things going, wow. Where, how are you coming about? Because John's as nice and jovial as you could be. <laughs> and he just wrote this character that was like, oh my God, you know. <laughs> and over time, each like we went through, we passed on it for, for Brief Nocturnes and then it was reintroduced uh, for Oblivion Particle. It was passed on. It just didn't quite make the cut. You know, oh, we've got too many slower songs. And then we started tracking with Powdered Seeking Animals, and it was, it's been through the whole thing, and it finally got to this record. And each time he'd condense it a little more and change the lyric a little more until he finally had this character that was, it was dark, but still kind of like, you could kind of like him. You could kind of yeah. understand, as opposed to just, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> And I like the first version better. And everyone else is like, no, I like this version better. But there's me on the side going, Oh, I want to know more about that guy. <laughs> Only because That's I funny. don't have to know him. I can see yeah. him from a distance. If I had to know him, ew. <laughs> I, don't wanna, I didn't want to meet him. Right. But, but I love that about John's writing is that I feel like this guy exists. 
Yeah. I feel like these people are, are as if he's just like been watching through his apartment. Like there's this guy. Right. Yeah. I know who this guy is not in a creepy way. It just in an observational way and right. seeing the beauty of life, the, the, the tragedy of life, the ugliness of life, the, you know, the laughter and everything like that. And that's yeah. something that's appealing to me about John's writing and, and this band is these songs kind of visit all these places and, and yeah, you feel like you know who these people are, or at least right. you feel like they, they're probably real people. Yeah. And, and, and it's tough to it's do both from their point of view, which is the interesting thing. You don't see that, that, what is it? That second person perspective. Is that right? First person, I guess, in that case, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't been in mean. English class yeah. in way too long. <laughs> but you don't usually see the like the song written in the term of the character's perspective quite the way these were. And I'm like, wow, this is like very cool. Like it gives an extra like personal feel to a fictional character in a song, which I just feel is like not a motif I see as often as I see things like, you know, symbolism and allegory and 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 all right. that. Yeah. And these are concise stories, which is which yeah. is kind of cool. And you talk about him not leaning towards darkness and yet like i think all these songs have kind of a dark feel to them they're not happy situations they're not it's optimistic more, more situations. common than not but i mean yeah. where are we in the world yeah, yeah you know yeah. i mean there's there is a lot of that around yeah i mean and, and i mean you can you can put your finger on any point in a calendar in our past and and say that to a certain degree sure but i mean that's that is the challenge of the, the human condition is to, yeah. you know, whether it's a, a religious idea or a non-religious idea, a social idea, what, I mean, it's always about overcoming these things, the challenges of life and everything. So I think, I think that's really just what he does is he just kind of makes these observations and then right. just happens to be very good at expressing it especially considering he's never really lived through. I mean, like the most, almost all of the things in these stories are things that he just writes. Right. It's purely a written thing, not from, you know, Oh, I didn't go through a breakup like that. Oh, I didn't have a death in my family. He has experienced these things, but not like these characters. Sure. I'm to turn my air conditioner off. It's starting to get cold <laughs> in here. <laughs> but, and it's funny too, and this is slight tangent based on this discussion. Um, guessing i'm just taking a stab in the dark because that's what came to mind you're a fan of the movie uncut gems i've never seen it you've never seen it oh, okay maybe i need to see it um yeah don't be put off by the fact that adam sandler he actually is, is oh, pretty fantastic oh, wait, wait, wait 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 hold on a second uncut gems i may have <laughs> seen this no 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 it was it oh i got the right title there Oh no no no! I have seen this. Oh, there you go. Um, I, it clearly I was a made bit, an impression. <laughs> I was a bit torn on this one, is why. Um, I struggled with it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd ha I kind of have to go through it again, everything like that. Yeah, I apparently didn't make much of an impression, other than. <laughs> um, I do like Adam Sandler, though, in spite of the, the silly movies he's done. I think. Yeah. You know, he's. I think he's uh, very capable entertainer but um right it's a tough movie because you don't know like halfway through i'm looking at the person i'm watching with i'm going i i don't know if i want him to success succeed in what he's doing or <laughs> don't want him to um in the end i guess i probably should have voted for oh god don't succeed because well for those that haven't watched it i won't ruin it but <laughs> yeah careful uh, what you wish for right right and I, and I struggle with movies like that. I struggle with, I mean, any story like that where, um, where you see people uh, at their worst. Right. Uh, you know, things like leaving Las Vegas. Mm. Um, you know, some of the, the Martin Scorsese films where he's depicting the, you know, the, the mafia type thing where you're seeing these people that are just the darker side of humanity. It's like, I I appreciate the the filmmaking. I appreciate the acting and everything, but I only need to see it once. Right, right. Yeah. And then I start kind of going, okay, I don't know that I want to go there again. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> uh, which is contradiction to what I was saying about the song earlier. But I mean, that's that was what right. I liked is that he was willing to just take this character so 
and it's not like he was evil right it was just, just more just this the psychology of hoarding and right so um, fatally flawed yeah 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 and that's and it's interesting because you talk about how he's not writing as a lot of people often do from any kind of personal experience really any any direct personal experience I don't know. It makes me wonder if the title of the album is almost him talking about, well, here's my perspective. That's some spooky action at a distance. And yeah, I'm not right, been right. There, thank God. That's funny. I didn't, <laughs> didn't think of that. That's clever. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of, don't know if you're a fan of Scrubs, but it reminds me of a line oh, in there somewhere where Turk refers to a woman as HFFA, not from far away, of course, suggesting her attractiveness is in inverse proportion to her proximity to you physically. <laughs> Which is easily the most Sheldon thing I've ever said. A, a Monet. Yeah. Isn't that it? Yes. Calling someone a Monet. Yeah. Or as long as you just keep a distance, it looks great. You get up and it's like, yeah. what? Um, you know, it's funny. I, I get a kick out of uh, when I when I hear, you know, when, when, when a record comes out, in, 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 particularly in this genre, the, the prog world, mm. the fans like to put meaning on everything. Yeah. I think it's great. Good. <laughs> Put whatever meaning you want. What sure. I think is interesting is how much time and energy people put on it. And it's interesting to me only because when I think about, like, for instance, the name of this record. Yeah. I, I could I could bring up the email chain that went on yeah. as to na- the naming of this record. <laughs> and it was probably the shortest email chain <laughs> that we've we've been through collectively. <laughs> because John sent the thing out. Okay, well, just coming close to that time. Maybe we should start thinking about the record title. Here's a few ideas. And it was a list of like six or seven ideas. And then Dave responded saying which ones of those he liked and then threw out a couple of ideas based on like song titles. Right. And then I chimed in with, uh, I, I think if I remember right, I canceled two altogether. I'm like, I don't like those at all, but I guess I could tolerate these. Right. And we went, and then that kind of went around like maybe two more rounds. And then Ted chimed in. <laughs> Wait, which is the one that we're going with? <laughs> and John responded, it's looking like one of these three. And Ted goes, I hate them all. <laughs> that's all we heard from Ted. <laughs> and Dave said, I'm liking this one. And I finally came back and called John, said, I think we should go with that one. And that's the title of this album. <laughs> There you go. Well, and, you know, I mean, there was there was some conversation yeah. with Dave and 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 John about like how the relevance of it and and just why they liked it to a certain degree. You know, maybe a a few sentences each. And <laughs> and that was it. That's all the thought that went into the <laughs> title of this record. And for all those looking for meaning, it's, you just took the pen. There's and- going to be paragraphs yeah. about whoa this thing and it has to do with this i wonder if it has to <laughs> when when john wrote this lyric in this fox beard song and <laughs> this thing when you combine that with the thing he wrote for this film and um, you can see where it parallels and comes and i'm just thinking no it was really <laughs> just the three of us making jokes talking about how much we hated all of them <laughs> that's funny but here it is <laughs> there you go not much meaning at all actually just the only one that survived it's the one that, yeah, well, I mean, how did the name Spock's Beard come about? You know, I, I'm curious. I've never read the story behind it's called that, but pot. I know what they're referring to, but I don't know. <laughs> it's, like, called, just... it's called Pot. That's what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> it's pot called Coming Up with a Band Trek. Name while everyone's sharing in a little bit of this and a little bit of this <laughs> and, you know, getting to the point where everything's funny right? and you have these, you know, eight or nine names that you thought were serious and then someone going you know it'd be funny (laughs) and i'm not kidding (laughs) that's 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 the origin of that name when they when they took a vote it was the highest you know you know it's like you take a vote by saying how many do you give this one i give this one five i give this one four i give this one three and then you tally up which one got the most votes total that's how they decided on the name. And Spock's won. Beautiful. Spock's beard won. And in the morning, they all went, so what was the band name again? And they were like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I love it. I've never heard that story before, but it's perfect. So, and and you, 
absolutely gave me a perfect segue. As I'm thinking about, we've got all these songs that are largely, I guess we'll say pessimistic, dark in their, in their themes. And yet there's this one song that's not, at least I didn't read it as such, that being Bulletproof, which then, interestingly enough, appeared in the last Spock's Beards album. So here we are going full circle. I'm very curious that now I'm sitting there going, I wonder if there's an interesting story there. And now you've led me to believe, I wonder if it was just a lot of pot. <laughs> no, well, not, no, I'm not part of that. And neither is John, but um, you know what? That's really kind of a simple thing. Um, yeah. When they were making Noise Floor, um, <clears throat> a lot happened, you know, backstage, so to speak, yeah. during the process of that record. I actually played on a lot of the demos for that record. Uh, uh, I, it, I I had not left the band yet when yeah. that, that started. Um, so I played on all of Rio's demos, that which and, and also a lot of the demos that ended up being his uh, Mastrophus record. Mm, right. I played on a bunch of those. And he released a second disc that has me playing on them. Uh, literally in his in his house in a bedroom we set up a little drum kit and (laughs) um so the production of that album began and then we did this one-off show filling in for riverside in atlanta Mm -hmm. and uh, a series of events set in motion my decision to to step out which left the band in a, in a position of, <clears throat> okay, well, who's going to play drums? Um, they asked Nick to play drums for the record. Nick came up with the idea of come out to Sweetwater and track it all there. Yeah. Um, John was not able to go. So a lot of decisions were made outside of John's control yeah. in terms of the production of that song. Um. And apparently he didn't particularly, he wasn't fond of them. Mm, okay. <clears throat> um, not to say that he thinks, you know, they, it turned out bad, but just a matter yeah. of, he's like, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have done that. So it's kind of just him coming back to an idea going, I, I would love a chance to actually do this song the way I intended to do this song. Right. Um, I, I even personally, we all kind of went, well, now? <laughs> it's it's only this far away, you know. And he was just like, "Yeah, I mean, I just." And it wasn't even necessarily going to be on the album until like the last minute. We had a few other yeah. ideas, and it just ended up on the record. And it's like, "Oh, okay, it's fine." Um, but it's interesting in that it contains most of the same people playing the same song, just from a different producer's point of view. Right. And that's really the whole reason it's 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 there at all is just you know kind of John saying, you know what. I want to do this my way. <laughs> yeah. Well, and uh, that tells me, I guess that take that however you like, you know, yeah. it's, uh, I guess that song has a special, I guess he's a special place in his heart for that song, a special fondness for it because, well, every song is kind of like a kid. It's like yeah. a child, you know, it's like if you, if you wrote it and you put the time into it, yeah. you know, I think that's one of the biggest challenges of any songwriter who gets into the art of songwriting as opposed to the art of making a record. Right. If is the ability to let it go. You know, I mean imagine a songwriter like Max Martin or, you know, Diane Warren mm. who who write these songs and then put them out to their publishers put them out for people to you know, either they go specifically to an artist or they go out and you know, the the artist will say, "We'll get a batch of songs and go, I want to cover this or I want to yeah. track this song." And then it goes through four other writers. Right. And the session yeah. musicians and the producer and all these things. So by the time the song actually is re- released, if you listen to it compared to the demo, very often it's like, is that the song I wrote? You know, and it'll have just their name or like one and three other people's names, yeah. four other people's names. But it's gone through such a drastic change that at some point it's like, that's not even the song I wrote. Right. So if you're somebody like those people, Diane Warren, Max Martin, that are exclusively songwriters, you write it. You move yeah. on to the next thing. But if you are in the business of making records and you go through the process of producing it and doing all that stuff, it becomes, it's a lot more personal. 
because mm-hmm. now you're actually expressing it. Yeah. So when somebody else gets a hold of it and starts changing it to the point of like, well, that's not really what I wrote. Um, it's not illegal. It's not bad because sometimes that can be a good thing. Sometimes yeah. it can produce a thing. And that's, I mean, that's the thing that John, he'll tell you is that it's, it's not that they made something bad. They just made something that he wouldn't have done. Right. Yeah. So I guess he just felt like doing it his way. Yeah. So, all right. Hey, it's good enough for Frank. Yeah, I mean, I it, I didn't play on the first one, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's cool, though. But yeah, it's the only one that struck me as optimistic in its outlook, and I always felt like that, that was like it was just planted there to be dark, 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 boom. And yet, hey, here's some light. It was kind of cool in my mind that way. Yeah, and again, I don't think that that's anything that John really... Mm-hmm. You know, because none of this is done from a concept. And even like on yeah. this record, some of these songs are, are very old. He went back on two or three of these songs to, you know, like they're, they're like 20 year old songs, maybe even older. Wow. Okay. The germ of them, the, the root element yeah. of the song. Um, which song is it? Give me one second. I'm going to look at uh, Clouds That Never Rain. Uh, Love Is Still the Light, which you may not have heard, but it's the, it's, right. it's on, there's two or three tracks in here that he wrote with other people a long time ago that just ne- either the reason they were written never came to fruition or just nothing ever happened. Yeah. They just, they wrote the song, they did the demo and nothing. And which he's done before. I mean, it's not the first time he's done this, but they, but he went back and revisited going, there's something to this song. Let's go back and revisit and sort of, find what's good about it and then right. add to it or, you know, expand on it, everything. So that's what these songs are. And in some of these cases, he actually, the people that co-wrote it, it was a woman that he co-wrote them with sings on it. Hmm. Nice. So, yeah, we, okay. uh, again, we, some of the things that we tried differently on this is I'm not, I'm not the only backup singer on the record. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> There's a lot of voices on here that, yeah, who's that? Yeah. I'll, yeah. I mean, I hear the tracks going, I have no idea who that is. <laughs> but there is a lushness to it that, that's quite evident. And I know from what I read that that was one of those various things that you guys went in saying, hey, let's change some things up a little bit. That was one of them. Yeah, it's and it's it's interesting, too, because people will, will assume like, oh, we had some issue with Rich and everything. No, Rich is a freaking genius. Yeah. Um, you know, he's he's brilliant and we'll we'll do more with him again i know i will do more with him because i love recording with him yeah i mean it's more just the idea we've done three albums plus we'd all we'd also done all those spox records and even you know prior to my joining all the other spox record that john did with him and you know dave and whatnot um it was just a matter of let's just mix it up a little bit let's try something else nothing no negative aspect of it other than you know, I like chocolate, but I don't like chocolate all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes well, you want something sometimes else. I want an apple. <laughs> yeah. A different so perspective. A different like that that's sort of the similar story with Rush and Terry Brown. You know, like eventually right. they went, you know what? It's let's get a different perspective in here a little bit and let's challenge ourselves in other directions, which I'm always yeah, appreciative saying, let me push me let me push myself somewhere else that I haven't been. Well, it's it's also the concept of, you know, we all have our, our core group of friends, but if, yeah. if you only hang out with those same two, three people, you only get that same, you know, it's right. it, it's like being in a band, you know, it's like, I like being in a band, but I like doing other things too. Yeah. And I like going out and experiencing that and then bringing it back to the band. Hey, yeah. look, I just did this thing, check this out. And then it changes the band. So yeah. it's, it's, I mean, that's what that is. It was also a scheduling issue. It's like, it also came down to, mm. um, Rich was in the middle of doing a handful of things up to and including he got married and, um, you know, went on a vacation. So it was all these things that was like pushing the production of the album out. And again, we're, we've been pretty good about, you know, a year, a year, a year. And it just was, it was getting so far away that was like, okay, you know what? We've been talking about this. Let's just do this, you know, try something new. And Frank is still an old buddy. It's not like it's somebody, some random guy. It's some, someone that, that John has known for a long time. Mm-hmm. Coincidentally, I'd been in his studio like two months prior for something entirely different. <laughs> of course. And so when, when John is giving me the address to the studio, I'm like, wait a minute, I was just <laughs> there. 
hold on a minute. I walk in the studio, I'm like, dude. <laughs> so <clears throat> it was nice in that regard. Yeah. And Frank's cool. great. He's a, he's a, you know, really great guy and a great engineer. And, and so the album, it does, it has an entirely different sound to it, yeah. which is, that's hard to deal with when, because I love working with Rich. Rich and I gel very well in terms of, uh, not just as people, but our, our engineering sensibilities, because I'm an engineer as well. Right. When we go to mic things up, I mic my kit because I know how he wants it mic'd. Because it's how I want it mic'd. Oh, yeah. It's like th we do the same things. We make the same choices. Yes, I would use those same microphones. Yes, I would place them right there. Yeah. Um, I don't have to think about, you know, what are the drums going to sound like? They're going to sound exactly like I want them to sound like because he, yeah. you know, we talk about our favorite records and our favorite producers and engineers, and it's all the same. <laughs> you know, all the Hugh Padgham stuff and the yeah. Steve Lillywhite and, you know, Mitchell Froome and Chad Blake and all that sort of stuff. It's, we're, we're kind of cut from the same cloth right, right. from that side of the desk. So I love being in a studio with him. I always know that whatever comes out, I'm going to be like, yeah, that's the <laughs> shit. So it's a. Uh, Sounds it's like you've fun. got about the perfect job right now. <laughs> yeah, it's fun to go into a different studio and hear yeah. someone else's take. And it's almost like, but that's not what I want it to sound like. And then you have to go, <sighs> no, 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 different. It's going to be different, right? We want to try something else. And you got to get into a different mindset. You hear the mixes yeah. and it's like, but it doesn't sound like rich. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, right. It's not supposed to. Okay. Hold on. Let me, re <laughs> let me rephrase. You know, come back another time. And, That's awesome. But yeah, it's great. I've been, I kind of purposely did that. I tracked and then kind of separated from this because I wanted to hear the mixes and I wanted to hear the record done Yeah. and hear it from kind of clean ears. So I could just hear it as its own entity. So it's like you're asking about lyrics. I'm like, what is that song about again? I don't know. <laughs> I have to go back and listen. What are the words to this song? I don't know. <laughs> I, I know the feeling. I can I can pay attention to certain things, uh, but they only hold for so long, and then something else pushes it, itself in the way. And uh, yeah, it's that damn I'm rich. Amazed at the things I've been able to memorize and the things I've not been able to. <laughs> so. Yeah, I usually remember every session I've done. I've kind of creeped some people out because they'll. We'll get to talking like friends that I've had for 20 and 30 years or more. And like well, my, my best friend, I've known him since I was 10. And I was just going over some, I have some old ADAP tapes. And I was oh. going over what's on them. And he was, we were actually getting into an argument as to what is actually on the tape and what, you know. <laughs> and he's remembering a different session. Because yeah. there's a handful of his songs that we recorded for different people three, four, five times, either just because we, we have better technology, let's record the song better, yeah. or let's we, we have someone else sing it, someone else interpret it, so we did it for them. And so we have this you know handful of songs that are recorded over five, six times. Right. And we're confusing as to, like, no, 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 it's not that session. It's this hmm. session. You remember we had so-and-so, and then we had this on it, and then he's like, what? I don't even remember that session ever taking place. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll send him a picture, you know. <laughs> nice. Wow. That's but amazing. I could I could probably sit here and talk with you all night very easily because you I hit told a lot you I could buttons. yammer on for hours. <laughs> I, you hit a lot of the buttons I love to talk about. I was a liner note reader when I was young enough to have paper in front of me and, and to spend all the time in my bedroom reading through that stuff and the lyrics oh, yeah. and everything while the record was playing so I could memorize it. Yeah. And time that just doesn't exist for me to the degree today anymore to miss it sometimes. But I love talking music and, and I love hearing about it and I love hearing about how the albums are made. I, I You've been so generous with your time. I really appreciate it, Jimmy. It's it's been very nice of you to spend the, this time talking. My pleasure, man. Anytime. Yeah. I hope the album is massively successful. I, I'm Madison sad I Square Garden. Here we come. There we go. <laughs> I, I I I wish I could see you on tour, but I hope I get to see you somewhere sometime. At the very we'll least, figure it out. The, uh, I'm I'm persistent. I'm not giving up. No, I'll put the vote in for you guys for the Dream Sonic tour next time it comes around. Sounds great. I don't even that know what it perfect. is, but I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate your time, and I, I wish you guys all the best. Good luck with the album. Thanks, Dave. And there you have it. Jimmy Keegan, 
Pattern Seeking Animals, the new album, Spooky Action at a Distance, is due out October 27th. So if you don't have it on pre-order, get ready. You don't have much time left, depending on when you're watching this. So thank you very much, Jimmy. I really, really, really appreciate your time. It was great talking to you. I wish you and the rest of the band best luck with the album. And hey, really hope I get to see you out on the tour sometime in the very near future. Meanwhile, for those of you watching, if you're enjoying what I'm doing, if you want to be able to catch up on the interviews later, reaction videos, whatever other stuff I put together for you, do me a favor, hit the like button, hit subscribe, make sure you hit the notifications so you're alerted when I had dropped new stuff, and just give me a follow. Real great to have you join me along here on this uh, journey through the world of Prague, and as I explore other stuff through the reaction videos and such. Also, check me out on social media. I'm available wherever, you know, Facebook, Instagram slash threads, the artist formerly known as Twitter. All the links are down below. And as well, if you want to get some all day prog, you want to find a station that really tailors to your taste in progressive rock and metal, whether it's classic or modern, mellow or metal, you can find it all on the expanse. Just head over to Live 365, check out the expanse. Got a link down at the bottom to make it easy for you as well. So that's what I got for you for now. This is Super Dave signing off. 